coming out tonight. Uh, and thank you, Eden, and thank you, Andrew, for having me. This is super awesome to do. Um, so the uh, the thing I'll be reading tonight is an excerpt from the novel that Eden referenced, um, The Wanting Life. And I need to give a little bit of background of it because it's kind of set in the middle of the uh, of the book. Um, so bear with me for just a little bit. Um, the part of the book this is from was set in Rome in 1970. And the main character of the book is an American priest named Father Paul, who is in Rome studying scripture. Um, he is at point we meet him about three months from being done um, and he's sort of been feeling depressed and down and sort of out of sorts um, so instead of studying in the afternoons like he should be he's been taking these long walks around the city um, and one of his walks lead him to Borghese Park the big beautiful park in the middle of Rome and while he's there he sees a couple old guys playing bocce along with a younger guy uh, who he's drawn to. Uh, Father Paul, I should say, is a closeted gay man. He uh, notices this guy, comes back a couple times, just kind of watch this game happening. And um, the third time he's there, this guy comes in like, what's going on? Like, do you want to play or something? And this kind of form a friendship. They start to play. This young man's name is Luca, uh, who is a, a young kind of Roman hippie guy who's a photographer slash waiter guy. Anyway, they start to kind of play together. Um, and a couple weeks in, Luke invites Paul to uh, a party at his apartment in Tristevere, which at this time was sort of like the hate Ashbury of Rome, kind of where all the hippies hung out and lived. Um, Paul uh, goes, even though he knows he'll be sort of a fish out of water, um, has a pretty good time, they hang out. Um, and two things, important things happen that night, I kind of weigh on this. Um, uh, Luca is kind of with Paul in Luca's room and showing him uh, some of his photographs. A roommate of Luca's come in, comes in and says, basically, watch out for this guy, he's gay. Um, and Paul, who's never really talked about this, later says to Luca, you know, I might know a little bit about that. Um, so they have this moment and they leave the party, they go for a walk. Uh, Luca tells Paul during that walk about how his mother kicked him out of his home, uh, disowned him, how he was homeless for a little while, and how that's how he sort of ended up finally with these people in Justevery. So they hug at the end of this, they've sort of gotten closer. Um, and for a couple weeks, Paul is just thinking about this Luca guy all the time, not doing anything about it. Uh, gets a call at the residence where all the American priests and the graduate students live, and it's Luca inviting him over for dinner. Uh, Luca's Roommates are out of town at a concert. It's just him. Would Father Paul like to come over and have some spaghetti carbonara? Uh, Paul thinks about it a little more than the last time because he's not sure if he should go over. Um, but he says, okay. And that's where the piece picks up. All right. That was a long intro, but thank you. <laughs> All right. A minute after Paul pushed the building's buzzer that night, Luca appeared at the bottom of the stairs, first feet, then legs torso, smiling face, hair dark and springy as moss. His neck was shiny. Paul stuck out his hand and Luca said, yeah, shaking's better, I'm sweating like a pig. Then Paul handed over the gifts he brought. Cheap bottle of Chianti, little bag of figs, small container of melting vanilla gelato. The treats had cost him a week's worth of pocket money, but it'd be worth it, he thought, to see Luca hold and be pleased by the things he'd, he'd given him, and it was. As he followed his friend up the stairs, Paul failed to not glance above at Luca's ass as it shifted in his white jeans and then heard the music coming from the apartment. Symphony Fantastique, second movement by Berlioz. Norb, his old roommate, had the record too. The apartment was dim. Without party goers to fill it, it seemed enormous. On the air was a smell of bacon, garlic, and incense. Luca led him to the kitchen, set his gifts on the little counter beside a sheath of pasta, a carton of eggs, and a handkerchief, and motioned to the chair he'd already placed to the side. No table, just the chair. Paul sat. I love this piece, he said, nodding to the record player. It's beautiful, isn't it, said Luca. I like the Italians too, but for me it's the French. Ravel, Berlioz, Debussy. My mom never understood it. For her it was Verdi or nothing. 
The horrible woman conjured by their talk in the piazza weeks ago flickered briefly to life. But now, under the glare of a single light bulb, Luca was dumping out the figs, quartering them, and squeezing them so the pieces flared open like a fleshy flower. They wouldn't return to all that. Tonight, their only job was to be happy. Paul asked, did you know Berlioz almost murdered his girlfriend? Luca walked over and handed him a fig. I did not. Apparently, she left him for another guy, and he couldn't stand it. He had this plan to dress up as a woman, sneak into her house, and kill her. He bought a dress and a wig and a gun, but on his way there, he forgot the costume in a horse carriage, and by the time he realized he'd forgotten it, he changed his mind. Luca snorted. That's what would happen to me, he said. I have a big plan to shoot somebody and forget my gun. Oh yeah? Are you forgetful? Paul asked. I'm getting better, but when I was a kid, my uncle used to say I'd lose my head if it weren't screwed out of my neck. Now I write things on my hand to remember. See? Like this. He extended a clenched fist, and Paul leaned forward to see. By Chianti, it said in Italian. The letters compressed at first, then unraveling. And did you? Paul asked. Luca backed up to a cupboard and pulled out the same cheap bottle Paul had bought himself. <laughs> Paul laughed. Perfect, he said. One for each of us. He'd been joking, of course, about having a bottle leech, but Luca quite liked the idea and insisted they do it. To show he was serious, he began drinking straight from the bottle like a wino. Bizarre and a little crude, but if Luca was going to do it, do it, if this silliness was a test, Paul would do it too. Tonight, he would get more drunk than he had at the party. He knew it. He would walk quickly home in that proud, drunk, stomping way, a target for thieves. Unless, of course, he was to stay over. For safety's sake, of course and then leave early enough to make morning mass. He could explain to the Monsignor if necessary, and would anyone even notice? By the time the pasta was ready and Luca was stirring in the eggs, he saw this all might happen. His friend, eyes glassy, cheeks touched with pink, slightly softened, looked as warm and expectant as he felt. After two figs each, they had buttered bread and wine, and finally the pasta, which they carried into the dining room, where there was a proper folding table to eat at. Mostly they spoke in Italian, as they usually did, but when Luca was comfortable, he tried out his English, which wasn't bad, but wasn't good either. As if to balance out the darkness of their conversation in the piazza, they stuck to what was light now. Meals their mothers had made, their strangest teachers, the crazy relatives who had cameos in their childhood. In this way, they swung from vine to vine over the abyss. When he was eight, Luca said, he drank a glass of his grandpa's homemade wine during a cousin's birthday party and fell asleep, snoring loudly in the middle of the floor. Paul told the story about his father's first hired man, a troubled World War II vet named Harlan, who had been so drunk one morning he nodded off while milking a cow, a hand still tugging down on the teat. <laughs> the stories were particular, but the what of it all entered him less than the story of themselves developing at the table, potential being made good. He tried hard to make Luca laugh, to perform his best, freest self, and was rewarded with Luca's silent, cracking laugh. In his dorm room on the other side of the river, waiting for him, were his notes for the approaching exams, two stacks of books on the early Christians, his Smith Corona typewriter, the letter from his mom he hadn't responded to yet, monkish silence. It was the place where he had learned things, where the Bible had been opened up to him, where the moving parts of the old gold watch had been removed and oiled and laid out in velvet. A studious and somewhat lonely place, but a good place because he'd learned a lot there, had been made smarter. Wiser Paul, that was what he'd hoped for three years ago. That and a vague desire to be made more worldly maybe, to discover something about himself he hadn't yet. And it was that desire that he was reminded of most now, sitting across from Luca. Slightly drunk, feeling younger than he usually did, on the verge of leaving Rome, ringing with pleasure in his head and heart, this was him too. He had desire in him that wasn't willing to be shut up. The pleasure and attraction was becoming an adult thing as the minutes ticked away, something less shirking and guilty and instead natural and strong. Always, he admitted to himself, just after Luca disappeared into his room to change the record, Always it had been thin, dark-featured guys for him. Bobby Darren, Montgomery Cliff, lately Elaine Delon. Thick brows, but fine features. Not hairy, no more than a dusting of hair on their arms and knuckles. Half his life now he'd sought out and savored these physical charms. The whole shameful enterprise below the level of words. 
felt more than thought. And now they had gathered in the form of the man sitting across from him, accompanied, of course, by unprepared for touches, the mop of hair, the pinned back ears, the tiny smudge of a mole on his chin. A real person who thought he, Father Paul Novak, was good company and a confidant, at the very least. The levels on their bottles sank. Time breathed. There came a point when Luca got up to find the ice cream which he had neglected to put in the ice box. Unnecessarily, Paul followed him there with a vague notion of offering to help and watched as he poured it out, soft lumps and liquid into two bowls, ice cream soup. Luca poured some Chianti in the ice cream just to see, <laughs> then Paul did too. Boy's silliness, but even as a boy he'd been so serious, hadn't he? So serious and eager to please, anything to preemptively win the favor of those who might scorn him if they knew what he was. But here he was, happy. Good music, a full belly, a light head, laughter. The white windows framed the darkness outside, the occasional car and motorbike dopplered past. It was a warm spring evening in Rome. He was here and nowhere else. Thanks. <laughs>